Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with our co-anchor, my co-anchor, our co-anchor and executive producer, Mary Gamba. Mary, how are things today? Because I'm excited about a terrific segment we have with our partners and friends at Valley. I am so excited as well. Every time we have anyone from Valley, just the culture and the leadership DNA uh, that's just at the core of Valley Bank and all they do, it's just always a great segment. So I'm really looking forward to it. Got it. Hey, Mary, could you also make it clear in addition to Valley who the other terrific sponsors of Lessons in Leadership are? Plug sure away. Thing. Uh, I will. Uh, Prager Metis, as you mentioned, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, the North Ward Center, and Seton Hall University and the Bucino Leadership Institute. Thank you to all of them. Hey, listen, we're honored to have uh, back again by popular demand, Ira Robbins, CEO of Valley Bank, and Thais Sullivan, Senior Vice President, National Director of Community Lending at Valley Bank. Ira, Thais, welcome to Lessons in Leadership. Thank you. Here. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, you know, Ira's been with us, and also you can check out our website. You'll see right up on the screen. Ira's been with us many times. There are a whole range of lessons in leadership that are worth checking out. Ira, when we were talking about Thais joining the show, um, talk about her role in the bank and why it's so important, because I have a special question for her. Go ahead. So I imagine when we first mentioned Thais, I lighted up uh, from pure excitement to be able to talk about such a wonderful individual she is and the impact that Thais has had, uh, not just on Valley, but from a broader community. And we recently elevated Thais to a national director role as, as we think the work that she does provides a much broader impact on not just uh, the local communities in which she operates, but much more on a national basis. And, and Thais, I'm so thrilled and excited to be able to do this with you today. Good stuff. Hey, Thais, let me ask you this. We've asked every leader who has joined us, and it's, it's people say, well, what is that question about? But I, I need to ask it. Your becoming a leader is a product of a lot of different things. The two or three most significant areas where you've been impacted as a leader, where does it come from? Well, Steve, let's just say I have some experience in, in, in banking, and we'll say 40 plus and leave it there. But I've worked for some great leaders and Ira certainly being one of them. And when you look up, you want to mimic some of the people that you see that are in the higher positions that you acquire to get to. And in doing so, you realize that you need to replicate some of the qualities that they possess. And I have learned from the leadership that I've seen, I treat my employees like I wanna be treated. I recognize and celebrate the small successes as well as the largest ones. And it also, I realized at some point in my career that it mimics being a mom. You know, when you have children, you always want to sit down with them. You wanna make sure that you explain things to them so that they understand. When they walk away, they understand what you're looking for. You wanna make sure that when they do something great that you're celebrating or you're there to support. So some of the skills I've got, I've come that come from me from being a, a mom to two boys that I'm very proud of. Let me tell you something, Mary's in the choir right now because I I, when, as soon as you mentioned, go ahead, jump in Mary, because <laughs> as soon as they <laughs> mentioned family and leadership and being a mom, and of course, two boys, she has two wonderful boys, um, Joe and Will, Mary, jump back in. Yeah, definitely, Thais, I get it. Mine are almost 17 and almost 20 in the next month. So I can't believe how just great it is and all the lessons that I've learned as well. And Ira, I know as well, we've talked about hockey and the connection between sports and leadership and discipline. Talk a little bit, Ira, about that and just the connection between parenting, leading and sports, technically discipline and not just sports because I know a lot of girls do dance and just the discipline that comes from having other activities in your lives. I, I think it's an ability to prioritize, to focus, to think what's important to you and why you get up every single morning. And those relationships, like you said, are from a parent to child and from uh, a leader to, to his or her uh, employees as well, which is really critical as to we think about what is our purpose and what is the rationale as to why we exist every single day. And having that broader perspective and not getting caught in the minutia is just as important when you're talking to your kids about their more macro achievements and what they're really striving for and not just focus on some of the uh, sequences that, that really happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are a tremendous amount of parallels there. Absolutely. And, and Ira and I have lost count of the number of conversations we've had about parenting, being a father, 
leadership, the mistakes we make, uh, the need to own it. And with our kids, it's a heck of a lot more important what we say than simply what we do. Thais, I want to follow up on something. Ira and I have also had lots of conversations about um, mergers and acquisitions. Let's talk M&A for a second. Now, here's the question I keep thinking about. Valley has been involved, and I'm not going to get ahead of myself. We're taping this as we get closer to March 2022. Uh, there are a lot of things going on at Valley that well, that's for Ira to talk about, whatever he chooses or he can talk about publicly. But how challenging from your perspective, Thais, is, is it when you're merging or acquiring another bank, all this coming together or trying to, why is that so challenging at times to bring it into one Valley culture? Well, I think some of it has to do with uh, the culture of the bank you're acquiring and the one that you currently are. And we have developed such a good culture here and it starts at the top and trickles down. And so we wanna make sure that who we're bringing into or who we purchase, that they align with our culture. And I have to say, so I am his biggest fan and I told him I will be cheerleading for him for as long as he's president. But Ira does a very good job in making sure that when he's acquiring another organization, that their culture is similar. And then we, as the his team, we make sure that we're there to welcome them. Ira, stay on that, because the last time we met for lunch, we had this conversation. How do you really know, though? How do you, 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 you go ahead. You, you, I can see your facial gesture, go ahead. <laughs> Re remote communication hasn't stopped us from picking up. We still pick up nonverbal cues, go ahead. Patience, patience, right? I need to let you finish the question. No, 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 that's not it, Ira, but I'm picking up from you that you could, as Theus was saying, you know, you, you pick, well, okay, fine, but how do we really know how you come together until you're together versus you visit people, you talk to people, you look at them on paper, you look at their mission state. Okay, I think it works well, but you don't know till you know, right? Yeah, I think it's funny when I first started in banking and there would be investment bankers that would come and speak to us about this is a different merger or bank that we should be looking at. It was always looking at your branches and, and a lot of information on paper and maps, et cetera. But those acquisitions and mergers never were the most successful ones. There was an acquisition or merger where we knew the leadership team. We knew what that management was, what they stood for, what their connection to the community, how important that was. And, and those actions really drive success in any merger, uh, which is ironic. You know, I'm a CPA by background. And to me, numbers should really drive what the end outcome is, but it, it isn't. It's it's aligned purpose, aligned understanding why, aligned belonging. And when you have a culture that's aligned, the execution is much easier. And typically the results usually drive a much outsized performance than what was originally anticipated as well. And that comes down to people and spending time just with people. Yeah. Hey Mary, as you jump back in here, I wanna get the whole subject of the Valley Leadership Academy and to Yvonne and the team on HR and Jake, the, the team uh, on the HR side who have been making all this happen. We've learned so much about, we think we understand leadership and then we work and we facilitate uh, with the Valley and the Valley Leadership Academy. We meet, meet so many interesting leaders, but for many of them, Mary, right? These mergers means change for them, change in their portfolio of responsibility, new relationships, reporting relationships. Mary, that stuff's not easy. It's not easy. And, and part of you know, our job, frankly, with the Valley Bank Leadership Academy is really just helping uh, these leaders to navigate those challenging waters and, and communicate and share information. And Thea, it's just a question for you in that regard, especially with mm -hmm. having people geographically in so many different locations. Uh, what do you find to be the most strategic way? Is it getting the people together with daily meetings? Is it uh, you fill in the blank? How do you make sure that all of your people are connected even though they're not physically in the same office day to day? Well, I think if one thing we've learned from the pandemic is how to make change and be there for change. And what I've done is every Tuesday we have a training session. And this is to keep the team abreast of any new product services or procedures that the company is inculcated. And we want to make sure that they un understand. Thais, I'm, sorry then, for, Thais, I'm sorry for interrupting. Can we clarify something okay. already? Thais yes. is in Thais is in Florida, Ira's in New Jersey. Just to clarify, we just brought on a new head of marketing for our public television production company who's in South Carolina. I just wanna clarify that she's not in the next office next to Ira, but all connected. I, I'm sorry, Thais, for interrupting you, go ahead. 
No, not a problem at all. And so I have teammates in New York, New Jersey, and I'm looking for someone for Alabama and in <laughs> the state of Florida. So with that, we have Zoom meetings. We uh, use email if we need it. We even use our cell phones if we need it. So we're using technology to make sure that we keep in contact. We have teams. If one of the teammates should have a question that needs an immediate answer, then they'll throw it out on teams to see which teammate, can, teammate could uh, give them an answer. So we are using the technology that we have for the benefit of keeping in contact with each other and making sure that we meet the needs of our customer. And that's number one. Well said, Thais. But you know, I, I, I've known you long enough to know that you really like being in the same room with other people. OK, and, and, and let me do this. Two things. Could you, uh, Ira, describe the Valley Bank footprint, please? So we are 3,365 employees, uh, 250 branches spread across New York, New Jersey, Alabama and Florida. But getting back to the employees, Texas, California, Illinois, United Kingdom, people all over, not just in the United States, but in, in different countries as well. So that being said, since Again, as we tape this program, things are getting better as it relates to COVID. We don't know where things are going to be, so we don't try to predict um, the future that way. Ira, how important is it from your perspective, again, all different locations, but for people to come, quote, return to the office? For us, we can do this for a really long time, if not forever, who knows? But for Valley, and I'm a Valley customer right here in Montclair, the, the branch on Valley Road is the best. I like going in there. I'm old school and old. I like going in there. Something to be said for being in the same room, Ira. Okay. I think there's one thing Thea said, if you don't mind, I comment on that and then to touch on that. But you know, Thea, the Tuesday meetings that she has, the interesting thing that we didn't pick up on was that there was a purpose for each of those meetings. It wasn't just a happy hour. It wasn't just to get together to talk about nothing, right? But driving a rationale as to why you're having those meetings and what that outcome is. I think is critical to setting up Zoom meetings and making sure that they're still functioning. Now, that said, I, I would agree that uh, being in person is important uh, for certain types of activities and functions. And to me, I think it helps build a culture. I think it's tough onboarding somebody into a new organization with a team that's been around for a while if he or she doesn't have the ability to, to connect on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So many opportunities I've seen within just our organization here where I'll have a meeting with one of the other senior executives purely because we're down the hall from each other, it spurs another conversation. Now that said, obviously, as we work and think about what our environment is today, mandating full-time everyone to be in the office, I'm not quite sure is the right approach either. Once again, it goes back to what is the outcome that you're looking for? And then based on what that outcome is, find a delivery channel that really supports what that outcome is and not be so focused, well, this is the way I did it before, this is the way I think that it's supposed to be done, but really understand what is that outcome? Hey, Mary, impact over what? Activity, impact yeah. over activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and be, before we um, get out of this segment, which has been compelling and fascinating on so many levels, the Valley Bank Stand Deliver Leadership Academy will be a hybrid, meaning we'll be in person for some of it, we'll be remote for other situations. But one more quick thing on this, actually being able to communicate remotely effectively, make presentations, engage in coaching, uh, run meetings, this communication, Ira is on the screen there, Thais is over there, Mary's over there, my camera's here. We talk about this all the time. We're talking to Elvin, our director, about this, who's usually telling people where to look. Why? Because this, um, I'll get off my soapbox, Mary, but this is important, being able to do this. So Ira, last point on this. Why is it important that the Leadership Academy is a hybrid, so we're communicating and engaging each other in person and remotely? It's the way that business is going to be done in the future. And if we don't know how to interact and learn it through these types of academies and other initiatives that we're doing, we're not going to have those relationships with our employees. And ultimately, if we don't have those wonderful relationships with our coworkers, they're not going to have it with the clients that they deal with as well. And the ability to connect, not just in a personal manner, but through Zoom and other technologies is just as critical. Well said to Ira, to Thais, we cannot thank you enough. And also, it's our honor and pleasure to be partners with Valley Bank and the great team there. Thank both of you. Appreciate you joining us on Lessons in Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. You got it. Mary and Steve, that's me, right? We'll be right back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, 
the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Arabato, Mary Gamba. Hey, Mary, it's great to see uh, Ira and Theus over at Valley Bank, the great team there. Yeah, but I'm curious about something. Uh, we're about to introduce a segment from Matt Whelan, the president over at Caldwell University, which focuses heavily on the concept of, you, you didn't think I had this book, Mary, right? Grit. I, I love it. I love, I, I don't know how you have, you're like the, um, you have like the magic garden, like everything is just being pulled out. It's whatever it is, you can pull it out. No, I know, I, I know where it is. This is uh, Angela Duckworth. By the way, check out Angela Duckworth, D-U-C-K-W-O-R-T-H. Uh, Grit is the name of the book, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. She gave an incredible TED Talk. We're actually trying to book her for our show. We will do that. And that is one of the subjects that Matt Whelan talks about. But Mary, this is interesting. Um, we're talking about the Valley Leadership Academy. You don't even know where I'm going with this, but that's okay. I said I was looking forward to being there in person because some of the some of our seminars now more and more of them are in person some of them are remote because uh we have some of our clients who are literally all over the country including some in hawaii right mm -hmm. yeah we just had a seminar with some folks in hawaii west coast california why do i mention that because it's great to be in the same room because i love that interpersonal connection facilitating leading seminars like that it's what we do that's the stand and deliver company right? One-on-one -on -one coaching, as well as this show and seminars. But one thing we lose, Mary, what's the one thing you know that I'm saying, wow, I'm, we're, we're going to be missing a huge piece of the Leadership Academy when I start going back out on the road more and more, and we're not in the Brady Bunch family box with seven, eight, ten seminar participants and someone else. Who is that? Uh, that would be me only because the time for me to join you on the road to physically get to these locations, there's a, above and beyond obviously being in the seminars with you and co-facilitating them, which I love to do so much. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff I do behind the scenes and business development and fundraising for our nonprofit and editing these great shows that we do for lessons and leadership. So I haven't figured out how to clone myself yet. So I won't be physically in the room with you for those sessions. So understand something. Mary not only helps facilitate those seminars, but contributes so much. But then as the seminar ends, this is actually true. Within five minutes, I get some bulleted talking points. They're, no, they're notes. They're not copious notes, but they're yeah, great no, notes. Yeah, no, they're not. They're, yeah, it's a, a highlight summary of what was discussed. So this way we have uh, not so many, but we have a lot of clients and we want to make sure that we stay focused and know what we talked about with one group because everything is so customized. Yeah. So I give you a high level, here's the areas we discussed, and most importantly, here's what the next steps are going to be, uh, whether it's an assignment, a video to watch, yeah. a, a 360 evaluation where we ask them to go to people on their team and ask them their greatest strengths and areas for improvement. So just by being there, it takes out the one step of you having to come back and communicate that to me. Some people may, may ask, why is Steve even talking about, quote, how the sausage is being made or the inside baseball, if you will? Um, but it's not really inside baseball, and here's why. There have been, and people don't talk about this very often, there have been some positive things about this horrific pandemic that has taken over as we do this program, close to a million American lives. It may be more than that by the time this show airs. I'm praying that it's not. But it, that's not the issue. It's not how many, because those are families that have lost loved ones. People tragically cut down because of this pandemic. But one of the positive things from a leadership point of view is that we're able to do things we weren't able to do before. Mary was never able to participate in those seminars uh, in the way she is right now. So the point I'm making is that, and also Linda Toro, who joins us from South Carolina as our new vice president of marketing, would never have happened if we were in New Jersey, which we are, you're in the office, she can't be. And one of our executive producers of our one-on-one -on -one nightly show on public television, where do, 
I don't even want to give up too much info. Where does our executive producer live? Yeah, in, in Texas. So, I mean, it's just everyone can be anywhere. And Ira and Theus were talking about it as well. I mean, she's in Florida, he's in New Jersey. So it has enabled us, and, and we've always been able to do business this way. It's not like Zoom became invented exactly. because of the pandemic. It's just now it opened our eyes. Sometimes unfortunate situations help us to see things in a different light. And again, one of the great things about it is that Mary does not have to be, we've said it before, what road do you not love to be on for a couple of two hours plus every day coming to our and, and the irony is it's 20 miles. So it's literally 20 miles from it's where New I Jersey, live. But it's New Jersey, yeah, 20 miles. In back. New Jersey, along the Garden State Parkway. And it's it's almost all highway miles, but it's that lovely area in between about exit 130 up to 148, 151, depending upon where you're lucky enough to make it to before you have to, you know, SOS and get off of the parkway. And just that quality of life and having, I mean, on the low end, it would be an hour and 45 minutes a day. And just, just yeah. having that time back in my life is priceless. And again, it's not, none of it is worth what has happened to people, but we have to try to look at the positive. That being said, uh, let's take a look at an interview we did with uh, Dr. Matthew Whalen, who is president of Cornell University, uh, actually signed his deal to come on board three weeks before COVID became a reality in our lives. Check it out. Lessons in Leadership is proud to be joined by, uh, pleased to be joined by our good friend, Dr. Matthew Whelan, president of Caldwell University. Matt, how are we doing, buddy? I am doing well, I guess. Given the circumstances, every day is a new day, a new opportunity. So I'm doing well, Steve, thank you. So we should, we should tell folks that the way you and I met, I, I remember it was in the summer, you had two summer, two or three, two summers ago, I'm pretty sure. And I was down the Jersey Shore, and I remember calling you, and we got into this conversation. I don't know why I'm saying I was at the Jersey Shore, but we just got into this whole conversation about leadership. That's right. You've been fascinated by the subject of leadership. We were comparing notes as to your leadership library, my leadership library. Why and how did you become fascinated by leadership? It's a great question. I just have always sort of wanted to know why, why does one person rise to the top, no matter their background, no matter their circumstances? How can they lead? How can they lead from behind? Um, how can they lead from in front? What makes a good leader? And I really became fascinated with that subject. And in fact, read some of James Burns' work on leadership and the difference between leadership and power. And so it's really a fascinating um, field of study that no one's quite yet fully mastered. You know, the whole concept of, of, of feminine leadership um, is a wonderful area of study these days. You know, let's follow up. One of the, one of the books we did not talk about, which I've been become obsessed by, uh, is Grit, Angela Duckworth. I know you know the book well. I can just see from your reaction. So, so and we're going to actually have Angela Duckworth on Lessons in Leadership, talking about the connection between grit and leadership. So I say grit. Let's play the word association game, Matt. I say grit. You say what? Perseverance. So, so the ability to, 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 to work your way through those situations that often seem untenable, the ability to actually, if you use the word grit the way it's, the way it's I think, meant sometimes, to grit your teeth and say, I'm going forward. I'm not going to let this stop me. Um, that ability to, to do that, no matter the circumstances you're faced with, you know, it is it's just a phenomenal trait that I think if we can teach more of that to say, yes, OK, I know you hit a road bump, but let's go forward. Particularly you know, in these ridiculously difficult times, right, President uh, Wellen? I signed my contract th uh, about three weeks, three and a half weeks before COVID hit. And uh, I had to grit my teeth and come on in. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm lucky and, and happy I did every day. Every time we talk leadership with you, we learn something new, Matt. Uh, Matt Wellen. Thank you so much. All the best to you and the team up there at Cordwell. Thanks very much. Have a great year. I want to thank uh, Matt Wellen, uh, the president of the Cordwell University. Um, thank you, Matt. I want to shift gears dramatically, Mary. I've got this thing. And again, the truth is we do so much on-air work. Uh, I do more. I mean, you co-anchor this show, but we do all the other stuff on public television. So I'm very aware of public communication. I'm very aware. And I'm not saying, oh, look at me. But one of my views of leadership is that a leader has to know the difference between how he or she speaks in private versus public. And something should never be said at all. Here's my thing. There's video of President Biden calling a reporter from Fox News a stupid SOB. 
He was on microphone. I don't know if he knew it, but he was standing there at the microphone. Right. To his credit, he apologized the next day. President Trump calling a reporter from CNN, Jim Acosta, an enemy of the people, saying reporters are nasty, making nasty comments. That's why you have no ratings. Uh, President Trump, whether you like him or not, it's not the issue. You like Biden or not, not the issue. Couldn't care less about your politics. President Trump, uh, let's just say apologizing was not, Mary, you're smiling. Uh, <laughs> he didn't love to apologize, nor did he do it. No. That being said, whether it's Joe Rogan's situation at Spotify, and I don't know what's going to happen there. We're on Spotify as well. To date, we haven't taken ourselves off that platform. But what Joe Rogan said in a whole range of things, public or private, totally unacceptable, especially the use of the N-word, but not using N-word, the actual word. Here's my point. What's the connection in your mind between being a really good leader and understanding the need to use appropriate, respectful communication at all times, particularly when you're in public? And I don't want anyone to think that I'm confusing what Rogan said, if he said it privately versus publicly, especially the use of the N-word, there's nothing okay about that. But he's also on the air, which makes it 10 times worse. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, one of the, um, the pinnacles, if you will, of being a leader, you are setting an example for others. So if you take it at the basic, basic context of what it means to be a leader, it's those who are looking up to you to set an example of how they should behave. So if you take that lightly and you're using words or language that you shouldn't be using, if you're losing your temper, if you're saying dangerous things in public, uh, flippantly. Hurtful just things. Because, hurtful things as well. Hurtful things. Exactly. You, you fill in those blanks. And if you do that, that's not leadership. That's just the opposite. Because if people are going to follow you, that's when devastating consequences are going to happen. And by the way, even though Joe Rogan, quote unquote, apologized, I'm not sure. This is one more thing, Mary. There's some, there are, mm, we talked about Colin Powell on another show. We talked about uh, his testimony before the United Nations. Elvin, I know there's a minute left. He apologized for saying they're weapons of mass destruction. That was wrong in Iraq. That was wrong. The justification to go to war, lies are lost. But it's interesting. I gave, I didn't give him a pass, but I acknowledged that he owned it. Joe Rogan said he was wrong for using the N-word and a whole range of other things he said. Do you believe there's some things, Mary, you quote, can't apologize? You can apologize, but you, it's still not okay? I'm not sure about this. Go ahead. It's so hard. It is so hard. I mean, if you, if you go by that, then no one can ever apologize for anything and then move on with their lives. And I think that's too uh, harsh. I think that if someone genuinely apologizes and then they make specific, immediate changes to their behavior, then I think they should be able to continue on and live a life and be a leader. And But they do need to live by their actions after that apology. You can't apologize and then the next day go out and do the same thing again. Yeah, apologizing with your words, but not changing behavior. And trust me, I know because my wife calls me the master of apologizing. That's only half the battle. What do you do after that to change that behavior that's wrong and appropriate and most of all, hurtful to other people? Mary Gamma, Steve Adubato, Lessons in Leadership. We thank you so much. And we do not apologize for this show, but unless Mary tells me I made a mistake, I didn't know about it. It's been a great show. Lessons in Leadership. We'll see you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen and I got my life back. The Sherry Network means to me hope, life, 
and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life.